Hi, Dr. Wharton, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, awesome. The, um, I just wanted to test drive the remote on your end, if you don't. Okay. Like to make sure it'll show, it should say remote control at the top and at the Okay. You want me to try to do something? I I, okay, let me. Oh, okay, I think I'm. Okay, I think I'd give it to you. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. Oh, I see. Uh huh. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay, awesome. So I can give Got it all without. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to test that out. Perfect. perfect. That works for me. Thank, Thank you. You're very welcome. Hey, Jessica. Yes. Uh huh. Um, are, so I'm. So we're. We can. Um, you know, both use the mouse and sort of um, go through our own slides. Is that is that the plan? Right. Correct. Yes. I'm awesome. Sharing it from my screen, and then once your portion comes, I'll give you your um, remote control access, and yes, you'll be able to go through your slides. Awesome. Thank you so much. Just clarifying. Yes. You're welcome. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Hi. Yes, so um, you will be first. So um, we were testing. I'm going to give you, we're just going to test it real quick. I'm going to give you your first, but I'm going to give you remote control access. That way you can control your slides during your portion if you'd like to try it. Perfect. All right. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. So you're good there. And I'll give it back to you at 12 o'clock. Thank you.
All right, good morning, everyone. The time is now 12 p.m. Thank you all so much for joining the um, ONR Research Roundtable with today's topic of new SON COVID-19 research and navigating the new normal. And we have our wonderful panelists available for you today. We have Dr. Lisa Thompson, Dr. Je Jennifer Frediani, Dr. Mick Young Song, Dr. Kenneth Hepburn, and Dr. Whitney and we will have Dr. Thompson off, and I will now provide you with access, Dr. Thompson. Okay, sorry about that. I could not find my unmute button. Um, and so um, I'm just going to start this off briefly talking about um, my work in um, kind of the global health context. And do I need to ask for the control of the mouse? Yes, I have provided it for you. Okay. There you go. Okay, so um, first of all, many of you know that I've been involved in this uh, randomized control trial called the HAPPEN trial. This is a household air pollution and health study. It's a multi-country intervention trial. We're providing um, half of the 3,200 households that are enrolled with a gas stove and free gas fuel, which comes in tanks, like propane tanks, um, along with the behavior change intervention to encourage the use of the gas stove. It's an 18-month randomized trial, and we're looking at many different um, outcomes uh, in, the in the child, it's low birth weight, infant stunting at 12 months, and incidence of infant severe pneumonia. And we're also looking at older adult women and pregnant women's blood pressure. And um, this trial, at the time that um, the you know coronavirus hit, um, we'd already we already had the bulk of the women had delivered their infants. Um, we had about 30 women in each country that still had to deliver. And um, I'm just gonna talk about some of the issues related to the study. We already Hello. started to roll some study of- Hey, Quinn, how are you? Yeah, yeah, it's still good. Let me just go um, like closer to my door. I thought I'd get poor. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so <laughs> let me see if I can page down. Why is this not advancing? There we go. So what's the new error in the happen trial? My dog is barking. Um, for, we had to go, you know, we had four local IRBs in each country and the Emory IRB as well. And we had to answer to all of them about how our study would proceed. We also, of course, had different um, case rates in each country. Peru is currently, I think, the fourth highest country uh, for coronavirus cases per capita. And um, India is right behind the United States whereas uh, the countries of Rwanda and Guatemala are very um, low on the ranking for case um, identification. So currently we're not doing any research in Peru because of the suspension of activities um, that are not deemed essential. Um, we've been able to resume in the other three countries to a limited degree. Um, cooking gas is an essential service. You can imagine you can't, if you can't cook, uh, this is a problem. And, most people use this type of uh, liquid petroleum fuel that comes in tanks. So we were able to maintain the intervention throughout the study, which is great. Um, we may not be able to collect health outcomes, but we're still providing gas um, to the intervention group. And I'm sure people have um, noticed that child pneumonia rates, maybe not, um, have not noticed, but since children are staying at home and not going to, to school, the pneumonia rates are very low globally. And that's great. Um, that is one of our primary outcomes, but we did have some issues with children at home, sick, parents not for the children to clinics to be evaluated. Um, but that's kind of picked up a little bit in recent um, weeks in the three countries we're able to monitor. Um, some of the transportation has started up. 
We developed extensive um, standard, standardized operating um, pro procedures in local languages and we trained our field workers to implement them. So uh, doming and doffing PPE, checking in the, in the morning um, with our, our coronavirus free uh, symptom checker. Um, and we go to the home to use the Emory required set of COVID-19 screening questions. Uh, it's we get PPE for all of our staff and our participants in many of the different settings. As we all know, PPE was hard to come by, but um, we do have uh, our staff wearing PPE when they make the home visits and we provide masks to participants. And we uh, implemented a COVID questionnaire and the, this is at really focusing on did the family move? Um, so maybe they're not, the intervention families are not with their stoves. Um, and then kinds of uh, hygiene practices, hand washing, which in some places uh, with limited water is challenging, um, use of soap, isolation. Um, some of these houses are crowded and we want to understand uh, crowding activity. Um, and then uh, we're looking at how this um, has changed cooking practices and energy use, healthcare access, food access, and food security. Um, what we what we did as a, pr a process of uh, evaluating these, um, developing these SOPs is we started to look at each type of sample that we were collecting, and they're listed here um, from buccal uh, buccal swabs, nasal swabs, um, dry blood spots, urine, and then other um, in anthropometry measuring the child um, uh, uh, length. So you can imagine you're trying to measure a child's length and they're screaming and uh, they don't want you to do this to them. So we had to evaluate each of these procedures and we used it, we developed a screening tool, which may be hard to read this and I don't have a whole lot of time, but where we said, who is the participant? Where are we doing this procedure? How close do we get to the participant? How much time do we spend with that participant? What's the potential for aerosolization? and um, what kind of PPE do we need? So we evaluated each of the procedures and here's a couple of examples. So we do lung ultrasound on a child. Where do we do it? How, how long does it take? And what will we need to wear to do that procedure? And the same for when we're measuring air pollution. Um, how, how does that procedure? So um, this is actually um, led us to create kind of a level of risk from level one to level four um, where we could assign, um, you know, by definition and by example. And so we've written up a paper that we've submitted for publication um, using this uh, risk tool. Um, so it's under review. The second study is just briefly something I just got added to kind of a little bit at the last minute, but this is funded through Fogarty International um, and it's through a, a clean cooking implementation science network that I belong to. And this is uh, not part of the HAPN trial, this is separate. And this is just looking at the impact of COVID-19 on household energy use in India. And this is um, working on this with uh, assistant professor from Rollins, Ajay Pilarasetti. And um, this just kind of shows graphically um, the energy use, well, electricity demand before and then during the lockdown, people were using less energy and then it's kind of coming up. Um, and this is just over a 29 week snapshot. Um, but definitely, um, you know, energy, the electricity demand went down. Uh, people weren't going to work. They were staying at home. And um, randomly selecting 600 participants who participated in a baseline survey before the lockdown and using mobile phones um, we're assessing different um, energy use patterns around cooking and lighting and um, and uh, whether or not they're actually using their LPGs. I should say that India is one of the countries that's provided LPG uh, widely. So um, it's kind of a success story for uh, cooking. Um, and this is um, my last slide here just shows some of the preliminary findings, which this is presented at people who are obviously interested in clean cooking. So um, for this group, maybe not as interesting, but um, just looking at um, whether or not they were using solid fuels uh, more or less or the same or LPG more or less or the same. So this is just a very preliminary from the first survey, but this will be a longitudinal survey of five or six rounds over the next 18 months to see what happens with energy use uh, during the coronavirus. 
so that that that's my talk. Um, and now, do I have to give mouse control to uh, Jennifer? Yeah. I will give it to provide it to Jennifer. I will take yours off. Thank you, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Frediani. You have control right now. Just there you go. Okay. Oh, there it goes. Oh, now I'm going to. Okay, so um, I have I've been pulled into um, the Radex program here at Emory, which is the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics initiative so this is an NIH initiative um, and to give a little history so for a few years now there's been a, and this is kind of a mouthful but it's ACME POCT is the acronym and how we pronounce it um, but this has been a group on campus that has been developing diagnostic um, you know little devices for other things and they were asked to kind of pivot and do this, provide this infrastructure for, um, for these COVID diagnostic um, devices. So that's kind of the history behind how we got involved. No, it's not advancing. There we go. Oh, um, so a little bit of an overview. This is an NIH initiative that um, was put in place to speed up the innovation and development from in the commercialization of all of these technologies. So basically we take, um, we work with companies that have developed some kind of diagnostic test and we do a lot of the BLCL3 um, verification, limit of detection verification in the lab cores and then uh, if they pass through all of those kind of checks and boxes, they come down to the clinical cores, which is where I am, and we provide human samples for them to test their devices um, at various sites. So it's, um, we have, there's many sites around, around the country, and the ones that I'm involved in here are the Radex Tech, which is the diagnostics, and then also the Radex Up, which is um, specifically for underserved populations. And we just got word yesterday, I think, that that is getting funded. So that one is um, out of Rollins and looking at underserved populations with diabetes. So it's out of the Diabetes Center there. Um, so I'm, I'm involved in that one too. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do both, but <laughs> that's to come. Um, and so this is just specifically for diagnostic testing. So we do have this um, infrastructure and they're thinking that it could pivot into vaccine um, clinical trials as well, once those uh, need to be ramped up quite a bit. But right now it's just all of these different companies with all of these different kinds of diagnostics. And this can range anywhere from um, an anterior nair, you know, swab pregnancy test looking thing where you take the swab in the nose and then you wait 20 minutes and two lines means you're positive, one line you're negative. Um, we have some breathalyzer type tests coming in, some smell tests. Um, there, I mean, name it, that's kind of the cool part about this project is the innovation of the things that these companies are, are kind of coming up with. Um, so they basically have a review criteria and we treat these like a study section. So we have um, kind of two meetings a week and one is to kind of talk about what's coming down the pike and then the second meeting is usually a study section on the validation that we've already done and, and we get to, we basically are deciding whether these companies get more money to you know, ramp up uh, manufacturing to get these out to the public. Uh, so this is kind of how it works. Um, and this, you know, all of these different ideas come in for a national call into NIH. The NIH actually does the first kind of phase, the phase zero, which is like a, they've described it as a shark tank like process. So basically they pitch and if the NIH people think that, yeah, they, it could have some merit, then they go further into phase one. If not, they're, they're done. Um, so phase one is kind of what we're doing now, and that's the validation, the limit of detection, and then some of the clinical, preliminary clinical tests. And then phase two is kind of a ramp up. So this would be like, instead of just getting 30 positives, 30 negatives, this would be like getting 500 um, specimens. So some of ours have moved on into um, work package two, which is what we call that, um, and, and some haven't. So they haven't made it past that, that phase one phase. 
some, you know, we've, we've denied because they were, you know, just too expensive and we didn't think that was a good thing to have out in the, the marketplace right now. Some were just too hard to use, some just didn't work. Um, so there's, there's different reasons why we um, kind of reject some. Um, so in May of 2020, uh, Wilbur Lamb is the overall PI of, of this. He received a $31 million supplement to kind of do this test ver verification um, for the work package, work package one, the phase one phase. Um, and it, we're basically testing the test and that's kind of what we call ourselves. So it's a huge team um, and it's really touches just about every section of, of Emory um, and Georgia Tech and involves faculty like myself and, and physicians and nurses, um, coordinators, you name it, lab people. Um, and so they, like I said before, they do the BSL-3 laboratories with live virus. This is the first testing and then they do their limit of detection. Um, at the Emory Labs and children. So this is a collaboration with PEDS also. And then we prospectively collect these patient samples um, at various sites. And that's kind of where I come in. Um, this is just overall, and I think this is actually old, <laughs> uh, but these are all the different cores that this RADx Acme POCT um, kind of has. And I'm in the clinical specimens core and then we also have this clinical studies core, which is another supplement grant through UMass where Emory is, is a site. And this is also just different tests, um, different companies that we're working with through this mechanism here. Um, and you can see there are some TBDs. So I'm, I'm basically doing three jobs right now, um, but hopefully that will change soon. Um, so the, the clinical studies core, which was that little box kind of off to the left, this is all work package two, so phase two um, companies that are ready for that, that manufacturing scale up. And so they need bigger studies. They need, you know, on the range of like 500 samples. Um, and it's, like I said, at the head um, lead schools are at UMass and Lowe. Uh, and this is a $5 million sub award to provide infrastructure in this clinical studies core. Um, and so we run sites at various places um, and we, some are using existing COVID testing sites through Emory and, and Children's and then some we're creating our own. Um, one of the bridge uh, kind of situations that we're using between RADx Tech and RADx Up is the um, Mexican consulate. So we're doing a lot of testing, big, you know, Saturday testing events where we test four to 500 people um, out at the Mexican consulate. And so that will kind of bring us into the RADx Up um, grant as well. So we're organizing that. This is um, just the, the org chart right now for the clinical studies core. Um, so these just show all of the different sites across adult and, and pediatric and kind of just the, the sheer numbers that is taking to run all of this. And that's it. Thank you so much. I'm here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let me take the control off, Dr. Hepburn. And I'll okay, well, go back to the, the yes. lead slide, if you will. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. I was, um, the internet went out at home. So I dashed into the office and here I am. Wanted to talk about, um, very briefly, about the project that a number of us are involved in, Carolyn Clevenger and Glenna Brewster and Feyron Epps and I and faculty across um, uh, Emory on a project that's been sponsored by the Georgia Memory Net, the, our, our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and our own uh, Roy Ball Center here. And that is a, a project for family members who are taking care of people living with dementia. Uh, we're calling it Na Navigating COVID-19 and the title we're giving it is Caregiving During Crisis. So, um, our general metaphor is that uh, dementia family caregivers are uh, functioning like clinicians in that they have to provide care, complicated care for people who are living with um, degenerative uh, progressive neurological disease, cognitive disease. And they need new skills, a separate set of skills for navigating the COVID-19. So 
Now, if you can go to the next slide. Yes, um, you now have control, so you can. Ooh, I have control. Ah. Yes, and you. There you go. Perfect. Uh, there. So, thanks. So we think that uh, people who are in this role need three sets of three rather complicated sets of competencies for caregiving. One is to know how to manage a person living with dementia and guide his or her behavior, as well as take care of herself. Um, thinking about the caregiver as an instrument of the person's well-being, uh, taking care of the instrument is paramount. <clears throat> and then um, to be able to, to maintain, uh, establish and maintain a safe home. And so there need to be sub-competencies in the areas of infection control, managing the risks of leaving and re-entering the environment, either as a caregiver or with the person living with the illness, and then other threats to managing uh, other people coming into the home, whether it's a plumber or home health aide, thinking through the infection control issues involved there, and then really managing the threats to well-being in general. You do not want to bring the person to an emergency room, so how do you reduce the risk of falling? And finally, uh, navigating the healthcare system. Um, acting on the healthcare stage, which I'll get to in a moment, and planning for the worst case. So what we've designed is an online course with the help of Emory Nursing Experience um, uh, instructional design uh, team. And this is going to be something that people can access online and it's going to be self-guided uh, course. And um, you know, pretty soon we're going to see if it works. Uh, so creating and maintaining a safe home in the bubble there's a whole set of information on virus facts and frequently asked questions, basic control, uh, infection control practices. I've already kind of gone through this. Um, and also the threat uh, of isolation, kind of um, being isolated, being um, sheltered in place for an extended period of time, longer days of caregiving. These are all threats to the well being of the caregiver. Uh, we see the um, kind of, we, we've developed this metaphor of healthcare as a stage, uh, where all the world's a stage. And the dementia uh, caregiver is really the, the key person. So she has, or he has to both script the lines uh, to use when encountering the healthcare system. So we're teaching SBAR, right? Uh, we're, we're kind of giving people a rough idea of what the history and physical looks like so that they know how to present it, present the case, as it were, to a clinician. Um, so they have to learn how to learn their lines, write their lines, learn how to deliver them, understand who the other actors are and what their expectations are, uh, and, and, the, and what the rules of engagement are within the healthcare setting. So all of this is being done in an on, online framework. Um, we are two weeks away from a beta test of this. We've got some uh, caregivers from the uh, Integrated Memory Care Clinic who are going to uh, be part of that group, and we'll reach out to others across Georgia for it. We just got um, supplement to the administrative supplement to the Royal Center, so we're going to be able to take this uh, national once we get it um, refined. Okay. That's 10 minutes. <laughs> the dementia caregiving uh, management is gonna be a short course in the Savvy Caregiver Program, uh, which will be focused around skills and strategies for promoting engagement, meaningful engagement by the person in daily tasks and activities, which is the core of what we've been teaching people in Savvy Caregiver and Tele-Savvy for a number of years. So that's what we've been doing with and uh, uh, trying to address the COVID uh, threat. I think that's it. Yeah. Mi Kyung. Okay, I'm here. You are here. So is uh, so um, Zuna. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm I'm wearing my headset, but he's just started barking. But can you hear me? Okay. We, we can hear both of you just fine. <laughs> Maybe he wants to present. Um, okay, so the title of the project that I'm 
going to briefly talk about is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on end-of-life decision-making among patients with complex multimorbidity um, and also their surrogate decision-makers. Um, do I have uh, control? Yes, you have control. Just try it out and it will... Uh, nope. Go ahead. Yeah, it says waiting for you to control. There you go. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing... There oh, go. there we go. Yes. Um, so this um, R01 supplement was a response to uh, research on the special interest notice, uh, which is about the research on the uh, 2019 novel coronavirus and the behavioral and social sciences. And uh, this study will leverage the parent study, which is a pragmatic trial of an uh, evidence-based advanced care planning intervention, um, so-called the SPEAR intervention, that involves 39 dialysis centers across four states. Um, so every a part of the world has been affected by the COVID pandemic and the pandemic has brought us uh, fear and uncertainty to all aspects of life and especially to medical care. And the research has shown that after experiencing a natural disaster, uh, people exhibit more risk of reverse behaviors and that uh, belief systems can change, uh, understandably. And that is people update their perception of a background risk and perceive the world to be a much riskier place. I wasn't advancing the slides. I'm sorry about that. Um, so this, uh, the scientific premise of this supplement study is based on the two bodies of literature. And the first one is uh, the studies have shown that the values and preferences for end of life care are stable over time, uh, especially after individuals made an effort to actively think about uh, their end of life preferences, uh, such as advanced care planning. I'm not talking about just completing a, a living will or uh, that kind of document, but more in-depth conversations. But um, but at the same time, oh, oops, let me go back. Um, another uh, body of literature suggests that abrupt and disturbing social changes such as disasters can affect the psychological mechanisms um, of uh, underlying a cognitive performance. So the effects of a disaster may bring um, doubt to clinicians and as well as uh, families regarding how to interpret an advanced directive or end of life care preferences that were expressed some time uh, prior to the pandemic. And that there is very little evidence, uh, empirical data to guide advanced care planning with our sickest patients in the setting of a disaster and especially when that is so novel. So this study will, uh, I expect to uh, generate some new empirical data on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on patients' end-of-life preferences uh, to address whether the stability of preferences is disrupted by the pandemic. Um, so we anticipate that pre- and post-pandemic changes in end-of-life preferences would be more prevalent in the control participants who did not receive the advanced care planning interventions. So let me show you briefly the study design. Okay, so uh, this is a very uh, simple set design but hard to implement across four states. Um, but this figure displays a simplified de design of the parent study and we have enrolled uh, nearly 400 pairs of dialysis patients and their chosen surrogate decision makers. And a sizable uh, number of diets completed baseline uh, data collection in this first session if they were from an intervention clinic 
and then two weeks of follow-up uh, before the outbreak. Um, so we use index date uh, to be the March 13, uh, 2020 um, as the index date. So in this new longitudinal cohort study, we are adding two more uh, measures. Um, so in this uh, longitudinal cohort study, we will recruit 100 dyes from the pool of those pairs who completed up to two weeks of follow-up before the index date uh, and have them repeat the study assessment battery two more times along with the, the new COVID-19 stress scales. Um, the ongoing multi-site clinical trial of an advanced care planning intervention offers us a natural experiment to explore the interaction between an evidence-based uh, advanced care planning intervention and a large scale disaster that could not be uh, conducted otherwise. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Song and Dr. Warden. I will provide you with your access. There you go. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. So um, I was um, going to present on two studies that we have um, ongoing now, but I think I, I might just have time for, for one today. Um, this first study is a COVID-19 sero survey, a, a clinical in-person prospective study that was um, funded by the Dean's Rapid Response to, to COVID-19, the, the, pilot, the pilot award. Um, and I first need to start off by saying that um, this study would, would absolutely not have been possible without the School of Nursing and the the faculty and staff that really drove this study. So um, faculty, including uh, Brittany, Daniel, Irene, um, Val, um, Glenna Brewster, and both my lab and my colleague in medicine, Dr. Who's staff, um, everyone really was on board. And, and when I say this couldn't have taken place without them, um, it literally could not have happened without every single person on board for this testing. Um, so, so we're, we're very appreciative and appreciative for the, the ongoing collaboration we have with, with all of these faculty member, uh, these faculty members. So the, the purpose of the study is to test for a, uh, to, to test a novel, um, serology test for COVID-19 antibodies and also test for, um, inflammatory markers in asymptomatic community volunteers and individuals who we consider at high risk, including African Americans, um, first responders, and um, people that were it, at the time in close contact with um, individuals that might have that might have been or definitely were exposed to COVID-19. Um, we did this in-person study in April in May of this year. So the, there was two phases. The first phase was in April. And that was that took place at Emory. And the second phase, we partnered um, with the DeKalb, um, the DeKalb County Fire and Rescue, and that took place in May. And importantly, um, you know, this clinical study took place before, you know, during the university shutdown, during the citywide shutdown, and before the the peak in cases. So. You know, we we're really interested in people that were at risk, people that were, um, you know, potentially exposed and to be able to test our, our novel serology test in conjunction with inflammation. And then um, what we're going to do is test them a little bit later. Um, so we tested 373 people over six days. Um, and again, this was in two phases. So um, the first was an Emory study where we enrolled 300 individuals and the second was at DeKalb County Fire and Rescue and we enrolled um, 73 individuals. Um, we did uh, 
you know, in-person testing, we did a blood test, and I'll, I'll go into that in a second, but we also administered um, red cap questionnaires in conjunction with, with other faculty from School of Nursing and School of Medicine with their input about questions that, and issues that they would want to know about um, concerning COVID. So um, Ursula Kelly, Arshed Kayumi, um, a number of investigators had, you know, their own sort of questions they want to ask. So um, in addition to our, our, um, our blood tests where we're looking at biomarkers, um, we looked at um, indices like medical medication history, current and past symptoms that might or might not have been associated with COVID, um, demographics like, um, you know, age, race, what you did for a living, if you were able to social distance, sleep, mood, depress depressive symptoms, and then um, importantly, knowledge, beliefs, and, and information sharing about COVID. So where are you getting your information? Are you watching the news? Are you listening to, um, you know, politicians? Are you being compliant with social distancing, hand washing, mask wearing? If so, why? If, if not, why not? Um, and then what do your sort of social networks think about all of this? Are they doing the same thing for you? Are they the same thing as you? Or are they doing something different? Um, so these are just kind of sort of pictures of what we were, what we were doing. So um, our first publication we have out of this is, is, is a, it's in preprint right now. And it's just, you know, kind of a how to about you know, if you are going to do a, um, you know, a rapid serology test during a pandemic, um, when everything is shut down, what do you need to do? And what tools can we give other investigators? And what lessons have we learned in order for you to do this? So, um, you know, we did this uh, again in April and May, and all of the testing for Emory took place in the School of Medicine atrium which is the top left picture. It's in the School of Medicine building. Um, and we went through a, a lot of, um, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different processes in order to find a place to, to do the testing. So, um, you know, we, we had to find a place that was open, um, that had a working HVAC and janitorial, a place where they weren't doing active COVID testing, um, you know, a place where we could do um, private consenting and where we could sort of safely navigate the space. And that in and of itself was, was a big, was a, was a really big deal. Um, so this is kind of where we decided on, um, and in the bottom left picture, we have sort of the School of Nursing, I'm sorry, the School of Medicine atrium. So these doors were locked, and I met each individual at the door when they were coming in, and each individual was scheduled. So we scheduled four participants per half hour in one hour blocks. And so we saw up to, I think our, our max was 80 participants um, in a day. So they were temperature checked, symptom checked. They came in this door. We had them sit at individual tables, which were sanitized between, um, between individuals coming in. And then when phlebotomy was ready, I'm sorry, when first when consenting was ready, we escorted them into um, this picture, which is kind of um, consenting stations. So they went and they were consented by a member of the research team. And then after that, they were escorted to a sanitized phlebotomy station where our School of Nursing um, faculty rock stars were um, taking blood from a massive amount of people all day, every day for a lot of days. Um, and this was at Emory, again, in the atrium. And then that was the first phase. And then the second phase, we went to DeKalb County Fire and Rescue because we have um, longstanding relationships with, with that community. And we've done past, um, past studies with them. So they were excited for us to, to come in. So we went in, viewed the space, make sure everything was um, appropriately socially distanced. And then in two days, we saw um, 73 people um, in that space. So that was um, uh, firefighters, police officers, EMTs, um, and you know they went through the, kind of the same kind of thing. So we 
temperature check, symptom checklist, escorted everybody in, everyone was individually or group consented. And um, then they went to a different station, which was manned by Dr. Kayumi's group, where we did um, some, vascular, some vascular tests. And then they went to the phlebotomy station, um, where School of Nursing faculty took their blood. We took about um, 40 mLs of blood. Some of that has been biobanked, and then the rest of it is used for the um, the novel serology test, which has since been licensed, and also we're, we're looking at inflammatory markers. Um, and then top right is just um, us thanking our team in a really fun kind of last day when we were done doing all of the testing. So we were, um, we took over the School of Medicine atrium, and so we decided to celebrate there. Um, so as far as initial results go, you know, primary res uh, the, the primary serology tests are still kind of, um, are still under underway right now because all of this happened so quickly. Um, but basically I can tell you that um, in the 300 participant Emory cohort, um, we had about half the participants were healthcare workers. There was a large representation from emergency medicine, both at Emory, at Grady, and at other hospitals like the Shepherd Center. Um, we planned on doing a lot of, um, you know, recruitment because we wanted this to happen so quickly and we didn't have to recruit. So because this happened so quickly and everyone wanted to know what their risk was and if they had been exposed, um, we're, we're just kind of traveled like wildfire. And so, you know, we were able to actively test 373 people, but again, we had a wait list of 300 individuals that we just, we just didn't have the, the capacity to get to. Um, of the Emory cohort that we studied, um, half were women, 70% identified as non-Hispanic white. They were, as you would imagine, highly educated, over 90% had um, an advanced degree. And over half reported having a known exposure to COVID-19 and um, also over half reported having symptoms that they thought might or might not be related to, um, related to COVID, which primarily was coughing, congestion, and muscle aches. Um, in, the, in the second cohort, um, in the DeKalb County cohort, 84% um, were male. 68% um, identified as non-Hispanic white, and their symptoms were a little bit different, which was 100% actually reported loss of taste, um, flu-like symptoms, and dizziness. So, um, you know, why is this study different? Um, we're, testing, we're testing, again, a novel um, antibody test, and we're really trying to use that in conjunction with um, you know, what, what my, my colleague in, in medicine and I do, which is look at a um, inflammatory characterization. So everyone's probably heard of, um, you know, the cytokine storm. So we're really trying to use inflammatory markers in conjunction with a serology test in order to come up um, in, in addition to, you know, information about demographics like age, race, education, um, with a whole system sort of profile of you know what is a person's risk, and then if a person becomes ex becomes exposed to the virus, um, you know what is your probability of recovery, and who needs to have treatment first, who might need to have a vaccine first. Um, that's really kind of the premise of our study. Um, and then next steps um, in October or early November, we are going to invite back all 373 individuals for follow-up blood draw, serology testing, inflammatory testing, blood pressure. Um, and then we also have submitted a number of, um, a number of additional funding mechanism applications, such as the um, RADx up um, application to look at um, minority and underserved communities because we're, we're finding some really interesting um, results, which maybe I can share with you later. But I think as of now, I am out of time. So thank you very much. I'll give it back to Jessica. All right. 
thank you so much. And now we will open it up for questions to our audience. Since we have the extra time, why, why don't we let uh, Whitney talk about her, this last slide? Yes. Sure. sure. Okay. Sure. I'm happy to. So, um, so I have a whole bunch of more. <laughs> I have, so, th so that was the first study that we did. I'm just going to go over this first one. The second one, um, we submitted a um, a Radex up application, which was mentioned earlier, and that is an application to address the barriers to COVID-19 testing and vaccines in underserved communities. And um, I, I've, in, in my research and my colleagues' research and a number of, I mentioned the School of Nursing faculty, we're all interested in um, you know, what, what are the, what are both the tangible and the belief based barriers to testing and vaccines and research participation and how are we able to address those barriers, especially amidst, um, it, you know, in the current, in the current climate where we have individuals and especially uh, individuals from African ancestry, black individuals who are, you know, we're mobilizing for um, you know, a social movement right now, necessarily so, but, you know, we're not able to enroll the same individuals into studies and there is major distrust as far as the, um, you know, as far as the scientific community. And I think a lot of that is, you know, distrust, it's misinformation and all of that are just exacerbated right now. So, um, you know, I've been talking to Kylie Smith a lot, and so she sent me this really cool, um, you know, a, a really informative picture on the left. And that is a um, representation from 1938 of a security map, which talks about um, the financial risk based on neighborhood. If you were going to buy something in a neighborhood, whether it be a personal property, a business, um, these areas in red are denoted as high risk, and that is because that is where black and brown people lived in 1938. Um, this is called redlining. A lot of you are probably familiar with that. And then when we were making this grant that we submitted last week, I, you know, I was just interested and I said, okay, well, where, you know, where do, where do people live now? I live in, you know, I live in Atlanta, so let's see what happens. So what we did was look at um, neighborhoods that are predominantly white and neighborhoods that are predominantly not white in Atlanta. So here you see the, the middle of Atlanta right here and the blue is neighborhoods where people that are white predominantly live. And then the green um, is where people that are not white live. And then the third thing we did was overlay active, the most prominent COVID testing sites, which are all of these red dots. And this isn't all COVID testing sites, but this is the most visited. Um, also, these are mostly drive-through testing sites, which is a problem if you don't have a car. So um, as you can see, it pretty much, you know, is a pretty stark, uh, you know, a pretty informative visualization about you know the, the continuity between 1938 redlining and current availability population-based neighborhoods and um, resources that are available, and then um, you know in a, a couple of other a couple of other slides which I probably don't have time to show you. We also overlaid um, um, food deserts, transportation maps because transportation, especially MARTA and bus systems, have been significantly reduced. So you know not only is it a problem to have a limited number of testing sites, but um, there is a problem in being able to get to those testing sites. So that's kind of the premise of the, the second wave of this and um, the new, the new um, application that we put in to, under, to be able to combat these, these tangible barriers, but then also understand what the ramifications of all of this misinformation, confusing information, I mean, it's confusing for me, right? And, us as faculty and academicians, we're kind of living this every day and embedded in it. But um, you know, what do you do if you have mis mixed messages with something as simple and simplistic as hand washing and mask wearing? Um, you know, what does that do to the trust of the medical community? Like, let alone if you're going to enroll in a study. So it's it's really no surprise to us that 
um, you know, the Moderna trial and everything is pretty much kind of come to a, to a very slow, uh, to a sludge because, um, you know, we, we don't have enough black and brown people, um, you know, volunteering for these studies, but I wouldn't either given, you know, past atrocities and what's kind of happening right now and the tools that are available to people. So, um, right. that's, that's the, that's the premise and that's the, the focus of these two graphics. Cool. That's, that is that's a stark graphic. That's terrific. Thank you. There's a question. Kelly, you have a question. Hi, I'm Kelly Goskowitz. I'm a student in the DNP program. And recently I listened to Dr. Kylie Smith's uh, presentation and she had this slide and some others. And in reference to the COVID testing stations, um, maybe I missed this earlier, but is there any discussion about making mobile units available? Uh, similar to some of the stroke units that we have that um, are available, like such as Brady's, I think. I have no, anybody got an answer to that? Yeah, um, from the RADx side, we are, um, we're in the process of trying to purchase an RV. Um, right now we're using the mobile care unit that Children's has. Um, and so when we go out to our community events, like the Mexican consulate, we have that. We don't bring, um, we don't bring the participants into the unit. It's mainly for, um, to carry our supplies, to make sure the staff has a safe place to, to wash their hands and, and go to the bathroom and that and get some air conditioning because they were using it over the summer. Um, and I guess through the winter, it'll be a heat source. Uh, it also is, it provides a generator for some of the devices that we test, um, require power. Um, so yeah, we are, we are utilizing mobile units and with the RADx up grant that we have, we plan on using that more in, um, to go like outside, um, federally qualified health centers, uh, cause that's what we've kind of, um, tapped as, as the places that we're going to go do our diabetes testing. Thank you. Krista Irwin has a question about vouchers. Krista? Hey, um, I was just wondering um, where are you doing recruiting for um, vulnerable populations and um, whether you're like offering maybe transportation vouchers or burn cards? That's a great question. I can say that at, at Emory, uh, what you get is valet parking, but you got to get there if you're taking public transportation. I'm not sure if they're giving vouchers. It's a really terrific question. We have so, somebody, oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. So one thing we're trying to do is identify, um, you know, it's, it's kind of going off the, the food desert thing. So the food desert model. So um, one thing we're doing in this new project is, um, you know, tracking 300 people with whom we already have relationships, but asking them to, to have six or seven people to make a massive sort of social network, which doesn't have to utilize gatekeepers, but utilizes people's personal social networks. Um, and then people are doing activity tracking and we're tracking on phones. Um, of course, this is, you know, voluntary, um, but, you know, we want to know where you go. We want to know where you don't go. And if you don't go there, why don't you go there? You know, do, do you not, do you want to go there and not go there? Or are you going to specific, um, you know, grocery stores? If you're going to get testing, do you prefer, you know, being tested at a library, at a church, at a clinic? Um, where do you feel most comfortable and where can we really go in? You know, the, the mobile testing site, I think is, it has been helpful for some places and, and we look for that when, you know, we finally up to the 11th place found the, the, you know, the School of Medicine atrium, but we looked into that. Um, then you, you know, we're also, you, you come into, you come into, you know, people standing, you know, you want to like regulate how close people are standing in line and making sure everyone is safe. Um, and then, you know, you don't want people standing out in the rain. And because we did this in April and May, it was just too hot. So, um, you know, we have to take temperature into play, but we're also thinking about doing this in conjunction with polling places. So please vote if, in the, if you don't want, you know, if you're gonna be voting, um, you know, maybe stop by and get a serology test for free. And, um, you know, we wanna know where all of those places are too. But, you know, unfortunately those have been taken away 
um, as well. So, but we're, we're trying to think outside of the box. And if anyone has any ideas, um, throw them at us. Like we're kind of working off the cuff here. So whatever you think, we'll, we'll, I mean, please join our team. Hey everybody, this is Drenna. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. <laughs> so I still have no power and I've just tried to master zoom on my phone and I've heard that I'm drawing on your screen. I apologize. I don't know how to get it off. <laughs> It's been one of those days. 2020 never, never disappoints. <laughs> Thank you very much for hosting and you guys for presenting. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to lead this. Jennifer, I thought you had something you were going to say a bit ago too about um, I just was going to say that that we are kind of tracking this also. One of the aims in the um, Red X Up grant that we have is to kind of do a similar thing where we're um, approaching people and asking them how they would like to be tested. You know, would they like a home visit? Would they like a mobile unit? Would they like to go to a testing site? Um, so that is part of our grant as well as just happens to be in a diabetes population instead of um, so underserved diabetes, diabetes population. You know, I, I wanted to add one thing about um, the study that we're doing, the online study. In, in doing it, we've really uh, understood that there are uh, major gaps. We think, oh, online and we can, we can make this available to lots and lots of people, but that's not true. Uh, if you look at the map of Georgia, the internet access is terrible, particularly in the Southwest. Um, and not everybody has internet anyhow. So we have begun to partner with the um, Gerontology Center at the University of Georgia, which has a link to the statewide extension, sort of cooperative extension service, something that uh, our researchers in the school ought to think about because they, they have an office in every one of the counties and they have excellent Wi-Fi to those offices. And also they have a local credibility and presence. So um, this is like, we're just getting involved with them and I'll be able to report back in a year whether there's any utility to this. But I think when we begin to think about how do we reach people with information, then we, we have to think beyond the internet because it doesn't reach everybody and not everybody has access, and this might be one vehicle for it. This is Sandy. I just wanted to jump in and um, with a comment and a question. This is great, and I really appreciate all the speakers. It's wonderful to see how quickly um, you pivoted to adding COVID-related questions or uh, creating a COVID-related study to a, a new study. So um, one of the things that I've noticed is that so many of the, the calls, and I guess this is my question moving to funding, so many of the calls um, are attached to other grants. So you have to have a grant to get the grant, the supplement or the administrative supplement. And I'm just thinking about, you know, there are so many questions arising around long-term effects of COVID and the pandemic. and um, you know, whether there are any thoughts or recommendations about seeking funding, you know, through either just the open mechanisms, like just the COVID related R01, you know, what do we, how do we think those are going to be reviewed? And then are there other special calls coming? Um, somebody in, in our cluster group mentioned earlier that some of the COVID related open calls are, are now closed because they've received so many proposals. So just where do you think um, that, that kind of funding might ha take place for de novo studies in the future? I'm on a uh, NIH study section for R21s um, through the uh, NIEHS, and that is looking at these kind of uh, short-term rapid policy environmental shifts and um, one of them is looking at COVID, and that's specifically for de novo studies, not ongoing RCTs or things like that. So um, there's been a, I've, I've, it's been very interesting to see the submissions that come in through that. Um, in the, you know, a lot around air pollution, but some around water quality and things like that. But 
it is environmental uh, studies for the most part. Sandy, I, I think there would be um, a lot of opportunities in the future um, without having to have a COVID-19 specific calls. Yeah. That is, once we have some preliminary data related to this, there'll be um, a lot of uh, applicable calls really, um, as part of, could it be, it, it would become part of a chronic condition resulted from COVID-19 infection. And also there are some calls related to disasters. And those are not uh, the areas uh, that we actively participate but there are calls out there. But I think I, it's a matter of time uh, once we start getting some uh, preliminary data related to COVID-19. I think it's, I, I think that's just a wonderful question. And I, my feeling is that we, we better think in a post-COVID way about, about applications that at, at the earliest, we're gonna get stuff in in February, right? And it's not gonna be reviewed until June. So the imagination, the researcher's imagination, ought to be projecting out to a project that might start October of 2021. And what is that world going to look like? And how do we use the data we've got now and the framework that we've been applying to this uh, essentially a year in the, into the future? Because uh, I think the, the, the COVID passion uh, at NIA, NIH will, will, will wane. And so I think being ahead of that uh, will, be, will be really important for our applications. But I think, I think the parent application vehicle is still just fine. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Well, I think we have reached uh, the limit of time. All of the cookies have been eaten and, um, and the, the sweet tea has been consumed. So uh, thank you to everybody. I'm standing in here for, uh, for Drenna and, and, uh, and thanks Jessica for engineering this and for um, emceeing it while we started. But uh, I wish everybody, thanks to all the speakers and everybody um, have a good and safe day. So bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again.